In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. More than once, it has come up in the past weeks that we have considered the vocation of woman in society and the family, and how she best reflects her vocation by availing in church, dressing with modesty and not in men's attire, and cultivating her own native feminine attributes, thus resisting feminism, which as we know, encourages women to be more manly, and also encourages or pushes men to be more weak and effeminate. We know exactly where this leads, our mess of a culture, gender confusion, disordered, and broken families. And so once again, we begin everything just by simply being honest. Feminism has proved not to be beneficial for women or for men, regardless of its promises, like the Marxism that inspired it. And nobody ever, ever really liked the felt banners anyway. So yes, our approach has been lopsided. It has been focused on women primarily. The devil focused on Eve, the modernists and masons focused on changing society by targeting women first. In dress, consider that women are now permitted, or really encouraged, to wear the most immodest things which no man would ever wear. Just look out in the street. The problem is lopsided, and so the solution is lopsided. Also, if someone has acquired stolen property, even if he acquires it in good faith, not knowing that it's stolen, when he discovers that it's stolen, he must first return it to the proper owner, owner before the proper owner can use it rightly. As we remember, feminism has sought to level the playing field by feminizing men. We must then, in response, encourage and promote true Christian masculinity. To, to do this today, we shall consider man's vocation, the Christian man's vocation, to order, defend, and love with a view to the most sacred heart of Jesus Christ. There is order in every kind of love. There is an order to the love of the Holy Trinity. Thus, making, God, making man in his own image, God has established an order in between Adam and Eve, a hierarchical order, with Adam as the head. And also, order in society and in the family. Pius XI states, There should flourish in the family that order of love, as St. Augustine calls it. This order includes both the primacy of the husband with regard to the wife and children, the ready subjection of the wife and her willing obedience, which the apostle commends in these words, let women be subject to their husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife and Christ is the head of the church. There is no such thing as disordered love. Disordered love is not love at all. You may have seen that tautology, love is love. It's actually false in its intended meaning, right? Because people who act on disordered affections do not love the object of their affections. Their love is not properly ordered, for it is oriented towards the satisfaction of their desire, not towards the actual good of the other person. For love to be ordered, one must love the right thing in the right way. Because men and women are different, how they ought to love and to be loved is quite different. A wife loves her husband in a different way than a husband loves or ought to love his wife. And again, this should not be surprising. To love a baby requires a very different kind of love than to love a teenager. We do not love babies by treating them as if they were teenagers, or vice versa, even if they seem to deserve it sometimes. It belongs to the wife 
to love her husband by her submission and obedience, to pursue that perfect submission and obedience that the church has for Christ. A husband does not then love his wife in the same way. He is not called to obey her, nor or to be subject to her. There is no such thing as mutual subjection, which is, of course, logically abhorrent. Although even the husband, of course, must be subject to God and to his ministers. A husband, a father, is called to love his wife and his children, his family, in virtue of his headship, by ordering, leading, and protecting them. This is not an easy job. You know, sometimes feminism wants to make it look like, oh, well, they got all the nice things. No, this is not an easy job. Why else do so many men find it easier to let their feminist wives take the lead? Sit back, check out. It is easier to be your child's best friend, not their father. It is easier, but not more loving. For the husband and father, love means ordering your household and as best you can, your society, according to the laws of Christ. Does not mean make, making up your own rules or serving yourself. It is very comparable to the priesthood. The pastor makes up his own rules, his own teachings, his own rubrics for mass, abuses those given to his care, even if they like him, perhaps because he doesn't challenge them or discipline them. But the good pastor lays down his life, his comfort, his being liked by all, his personal preferences for the sheep. He too is subject to authority, and so he teaches the hard sayings of Jesus Christ in season and out of season. Just so should all men be. The injunctions that St. Paul gives to St. Timothy apply to all Christian men. Be constant, he says, in season and out of season. Reprove, entreat, rebuke in all patience and doctrine. He says that one ought to flee youthful desires and pursue justice, faith, charity, and peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. The servant of the Lord must not wrangle, but be mild towards all men, apt to teach, patient, with modesty admonishing them that resist the truth. This, then, is how you love your wives and your children, your employees, your society. This is true masculine love, love that orders, not selfishly, but administers the order, the teachings and commands given by Christ through his holy church. As St. Paul also warns us of the contrary, of effeminate men who seek their own pleasure and gratification or who shun the burdens of noble leadership and responsibility. In the same epistle he writes, in the last days shall come dangerous times. Men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, haughty, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, wicked, without affection, without peace, slanderers, incontinent, unmerciful, without kindness, traitors, stubborn, puffed up, and lovers of pleasure more than of God. Just as women must embrace their femininity in their attire, attire and mannerisms, so must men engage their masculinity with their whole being. Men, be what God has called you to be. Be what God needs you to be. So what does God need me for? Our Lord is nailed to the cross. You must be his hands. You must carry out his commands in your families and in society. Christ could have called down legions of angels. He could do as much now. But he does not will this. He could send the angels to establish right order in your houses or in your society. He does not will this. He has sent you as the guardians of society, 
the guardians of your families. You are his soldiers. You have to go into the battlefield so that women do not. No society that has healthy masculinity sends its women to war. But when men are weak and refuse to carry out their duties, God will shame them by raising up a woman to do their job for them. As we see in the cases of Judith and St. Joan of Arc, who were given special graces and revelations to do what normally women ought not to do. On this theme, Pope Pius XI reminds us, if the husband neglect his duty, it falls to the wife to take his place in directing the family. But the structure of the family and its fundamental law established and confirmed by God, must always and everywhere be maintained intact. If your wife has had to step up and lead the family in, in prayer, in disciplining the children, or in working to support the family, if she has to leave the house and do jobs appropriate for men where there is no true necessity for her to do that, if she has to defend the faith and good morals while you stand by shrinking next to her, you are neglecting your duty. And the just judge will have harsh things to say to you when he comes to see how you acted in his stead with his authority. As with women, men ought to wear appropriate attire that expresses who they really are. Not, for instance, going about in public like a slob. Walk around and you will see many women spending a lot of money to be immodestly dressed, barely dressed at all. And you will see men spending hardly any money to go about in gym shorts and t-shirts. This betrays a reluctance to be authoritative and manly. Similarly, effeminate attire, styled womanly hair, tight-fitting clothing, flashy colors, and so forth, do not express noble masculinity. The vocation of men is different from that of women. All women are called to be wives and mothers of some form. All women, even consecrated religious, third orders, or single women, are called to be subject to a head to their religious superior, their husbands, fathers, directors, and thus to the, thereby fulfill their vocation to be the heart, the heart of the family, the heart of society. This is proven so easily today because we see with those poor sisters what happens when the heart gets disordered and it leaves the home, puts off religious dress, starts becoming obedient to a foreign master, Disaster. You want to attack the body, aim for the heart, right? All men are thus called to be husbands and fathers, to love women and children, their inferiors and subjects, as the head loves the body. Men are called to exercise their masculinity so that women may be free to cultivate their femininity. This means not simply instructing your children and disciplining them, but your whole family, your wife as well. There is only one head of every family, and as head, you are responsible for the governance of all the members. Remember, as much as people like to get their own way, as much as your wife or children may like to be their own boss, no woman, no child, respects an effeminate man. No woman respects a pushover, even if it seems that it is benefiting her. For it does not benefit her. Men, you must lead your families. Bring your wives and daughters out of feminism and away from masculine dress and attitudes and defend them from these when the world tries to push them on them. Not because it makes your life easier, not because it is what they always feel like doing, but because it is what is good for them. 
The husband and father loves by ordering. He loves by commanding, by defending, by disciplining. To refuse to discipline your families, to refuse to call your wives to the obedience they have sworn to you by their wedding vows, is to refuse your vocation. It is a refusal to love. Now, of course, this does not mean being a drill sergeant or micromanaging every little thing. But it does mean that the buck stops with you and everyone should know it. Nor does it mean that all discipline is necessarily love. Simply commanding and ruling others is not necessarily love. Men must meditate deeply on the Sacred Heart. It is easy to get caught up in the mission, become single-minded, be focused on the task at hand, and thus it's easy to fall into disciplining for the sake of discipline, ordering for the sake of order. And when we do that, it's also easy to put yourselves first, to call others to a greater obedience to you than is warranted to satisfy your own whims or pride. Woe to the man who abuses the power and authority loaned to him by Christ. To keep on the middle path so that you use your authority without abusing it. You must constantly return to the font, return to the source of all your authority, Christ. You must learn humble obedience yourself before you can expect it of others. You must learn discipline yourself before you can expect it of others. You must learn from Christ, who is meek and humble of heart, and yet has all power and authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth. You must not exercise your authority with pride, cruelty, or harshness, or any other motive than love. Love is the only motive for the incarnation, for the passion, the suffering, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do well to remember that these words by Paul apply to masculine authoritative love as well. Charity is patient, is kind, charity envieth not, dealeth not perversely, is not puffed up, is not ambitious, seeketh not her own, is not provoked to anger, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love your wives, your children, your inferiors, and subjects, as Christ loved the church, love that is sacrificial, love that places what is good for them above what is pleasurable for you, love that requires your heart to be joined to the most sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ as the source of all your authority, all your power, the source of your whole being. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.